Well, welcome everyone. This is very exciting. So welcome to the Great Divide race in our region. As having been in St. Louis for, lived here for approximately 29 years, what I'm sure of is when St. Louis decides to do something and to come together to help resolve issues, it gets done and you call a group of people together to see how do we address those things. My name is Yolanda Nevels. And I am the Chief Administrative Officer of the YWCA of Metro St. Louis. The YWCA is dedicated to eliminating racism, empowering women, and promoting peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all. I've had the pleasure of being a part of the YWCA for 26 years, and it's a pleasure to be here with each of you this afternoon. On behalf of our co-sponsors, which include the Interfaith Partnership, Jewish Community Relations, the Merowitz Center at Covenant Place, the National Council of Jewish Women, St. Louis Chapter, the Peace and Justice Commission of the Archdiocese of St. Louis, and the nonprofit organization Before Ferguson, Beyond Ferguson. I'd like to welcome you to today's program, the first of a four-part series that would examine systemic racism in four areas, economics, access to health care and the environment and courts. Our format for all four of these forms will include a perspective from clergy members, remarks from our keynote speaker that will dive deeply into the issue, and then an opportunity to hear from St. Louis citizen who can share the real life challenges of systemic racism. We will also include resources to dip in, deepen your learning and take action to improve racial equality in our region. And finally, we will leave some time to move into breakout rooms to spend some time discussing and reflecting on what we have heard today. To begin, I'd like to introduce Alyssa Bainford, the Director of Civic Engagement for the Jewish Community Relations Council to provide an overview on systemic racism and review community standards for today's meeting. Alyssa. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. I am going to share my screen with you all. Okay. So before we dive into this program, we really want to create a shared vocabulary so that we're able to better understand each other as we move through these sessions. To begin, we're going to name three types of racism, individual, cultural, and systemic. Now, none of these are completely separate. They all work together to keep the status quo, but let's break them down. So individual racism refers to an individual's beliefs, attitudes, and actions that perpetuate racism. So examples include telling racist jokes, not hiring qualified individuals because of their race. Um, and it also encompasses actually something called collusion. And collusion is the act of going along with or accepting things the way that they are. You may be less familiar with a subcategory of individual racism that I'd really like to call out. It's called liberal racism. This refers to statements or actions of masked denial, minimization, defensiveness, or guilt. So someone claiming not to be racist because they voted for uh, former President Obama, or because they understand the pain of racism because they experience a different form of oppression. Both of those are types of liberal racism. Okay, let's move on to cultural racism. Cultural racism refers to representations, messages, and stories conveying the idea that white behavior or values are better than others. You'll see cultural racism promoted in advertisements, in TV, and movies, and so on. So to give you an example, what does the bad guy normally wear in movies? They wear black. What does the good guy usually wear? They were white. Angel food cake is white. Devil food cake is black. So these are just some examples of cultural racism that's found in our society. And not only does it 
perpetuate ideas of racial superiority of white people, it also enforces internalized racism within people of color. So then lastly, there is systemic racism, which has the subcategories of structural racism and institutional racism. These terms are often used interchangeably. But to give you an example of institutional racism, it can be found within government policies that explicitly restricted the ability of people to get loans to buy or improve their homes in neighborhoods with high concentrations of African Americans. This is also known as redlining. So that's an example of institutional racism. Structural racism is the normalization and legitimization of dynamics. So an example of structural racism is the huge difference in life expectancy between the black population and the white population. So then take those two, wrap it into a whole, systemic racism as a whole is the distribution of resources, power and opportunity, which disadvantage black people and people of color. Where can we find systematic racism? Well, we find it in banks and schools and government agencies and law enforcement and military, et cetera. What is a result of system, systemic racism? Well, so much, but some of the examples are disparities of wealth and income, employment, criminal justice charges, home ownership, levels of education, representation in politics, health and mortality rates, and just so many more areas. But systemic racism also shows up in other ways too that you might not normally think about. So for example, if a school or a business is prohibiting dreadlocks, cornrows, or braids, that is also an example of systemic racism. So our topic today is economic disparities. And that is a direct result of systemic racism perpetuated by cultural and individual racism. See how they all work together. There are a tremendous number of factors that play into the huge economic disparities that we see today. And we don't have time to go into every piece of the puzzle. But something important to note is that African Americans were heavily prevented from accu accumulating generational wealth. Just a few examples of this include slavery, Jim Crow laws, the GI Bill, violence, redlining, restrictive covenants, and so many more that prevented generational wealth. So that doesn't even cover the continuing issues of today. As you can see on this graph from the Institute of Policy Studies, the racial wealth divide has grown over the last three decades and it continues to grow. Okay, so what are we striving for? Obviously, we want to eliminate racism, but it has to go further than that. We have to create equity. Okay, so what is equity? And why aren't we using the term equality? Here's, a, here's an illustration showing. So equity is giving everyone the exact same resource. I'm sorry, equality is giving everyone the exact same resources. Equity is the distribution of resources based on individual needs. It takes into account differing circumstances in order to reach an equal outcome. All right, so I know that's a lot of information that I just threw at you. We'll go over these before each session and we can send a list of definitions in the follow-up. But before we jump in, these topics can be challenging and we have a list of group norms to help us guide us through this conversation and future conversations uh, discussing topics such as race. So please keep these in mind as we move forward. Hold the assumption that everyone is coming into this with the best intentions. Do not deny the reality of someone else's lived experiences. Know that you may not agree with everything that is discussed in these programs, but be open to hearing other perspectives. Allow others to finish their thoughts before adding your own. Be aware of how much space you are taking up in the meeting and adjust to allow others to step up. Be open to continued learning and suggestions, especially if there's a misstep. And be prepared to sit with some discomfort and know that that discomfort is the path towards growth. 
That's all I have for you today. Yolanda, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Alyssa. That was very helpful. And as we move forward into the agenda and the program today to keep in mind the terminology and the community standards that we just heard from Alyssa. It is now my honor to introduce to you all Rabbi Amy Fader. Rabbi Fader is the spiritual leader of Temple Israel, a native Saint, a Saint Louis native. She has served Temple Israel's community since 2006. And as a trained vocalist, she also leads music at the congregation. In addition to music, her passion and significant contributions are interfaith outreach and education for all. She has influenced her congregation's efforts in both social justice and racial equity in programming. Rabbi Fader, we are honored to have you with us today to explore the Jewish imperative for racial equity. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. So, um, you know, when Alyssa asked me to talk about this, I thought that really first and foremost, I should acknowledge that, of course, not everyone who is on this call today is Jewish. And I think it's important to recognize that, at least in the very beginning of the Hebrew Bible, for those of us who count that as one of our sacred scriptures, we hear that in the creation story, God says that all of us are made with Salam Elohim. All of us are made in the image of God, which means that in some way, all of us are equal. All of us are somehow made to be in God's image, whatever that image may be. But that's not really the Jewish story, I should say, because the Jewish story doesn't so much begin with creation or with Adam and Eve or with Noah or even with Abraham. The Jewish story really begins with the idea that the Jewish people were slaves in Egypt and they were freed. And that idea of knowing what it was like to be a slave is something that comes into every single aspect of Jewish life. So much so that on Passover, when we come together for a Passover Seder, we say, behold, Dor Vador, in every generation, Chayal Vadam, uh, every person needs Lirot Eretzmo Ki'ilhu Yatsami Mitzrayim, to be able to see themselves as if they came out of Egypt. In every generation, every person needs to see themselves as if they came out of Egypt. It's not about sympathy or empathy. We are truly supposed to imagine that we know what it's like to be oppressed, that we know what it's like to experience such suffering so that we never allow that to happen to other people. But I know, of course, that that is not so easy. And especially when it comes to something like economics, we can't just easily say, oh, you know, I, I know what it's like to be someone who is in a different position than I am. Um, and the truth is that economics is not necessarily an easy topic. Um, when I went to college, my, my degrees in music and Judaic studies. So I never once took an economics class. And I will say, you know, having a degree in music and Judaic studies doesn't really leave you fit to be much of anything except for maybe a rabbi. But, but this idea of economics, this is something that is deep within Jewish culture. Even in the Torah itself, so many of the laws that we find there, they are about economics. They are about justice. They are about fairness. And I think maybe the most important teachings about um, economic equality, economic equity in the Torah. It comes from this one portion and it's very interesting. There's a line that says um, that in the land that God has given you, there will never be poor people. And then about two sentences later, it says, this is what you're gonna do with the poor people in your land. And so the rabbis of Jewish tradition would say, well, how can this be? Was this some sort of mistake? Then in the Torah, first it says, there's never gonna be poor people in your land. And then two lines later, it says, no, this is what you should do with poor people. But I think that it's not a mistake. The reason that we have this in here is because first we need to be reminded that we should not be living with a model of scarcity. The Jewish tradition says that yes, God has given us everything that we need. There is enough food. There is enough shelter. There is enough quality education. Maybe there are even enough vaccines. The problem is, how do we all get them? If we don't live with that model of scarcity, if we believe that in fact there is enough for everyone, we then have to go to that next teaching in the Torah that says, okay, this is how you're going to make it happen. And we know that it's not easy. That God reminds us in the Torah that in fact, throughout eternity, we are going to have to keep working to make this model happen, to be able to help those who for whatever reason have less. 
But I'll close with maybe my favorite teaching in Jewish tradition. It comes from, um, from a work called Pirkei Avot, which is written around the year uh, 200 CE. And the idea, it says in it, Lo alecha ham more. It is not up to you to finish the work. But neither are you free to desist from it. It's a reminder that there will always be poor in our land, that there will always be the sense that we do not have quality and that we do not have equity, but it is still up to us to do the work to make it happen. And that even for all of us who are on the call today, who are so passionate about this, we need to make sure that we do not think to ourselves, if we can't accomplish this work, that means it shouldn't be done. No, it means we may never be able to accomplish everything we want to, but still together, we can at least make some sort of a difference and work back to that model of abundance that says that perhaps really everything can be provided for us, for equality, for equity, if in fact we can work together to find it. Thanks. Wow, thank you, Rabbi Fader, uh, reminding us that we do not all have to live, we do not have to live with a model, with a model of scarcity. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Ray Bashira. Ray Bashira is the director of Center for Household Financial Stability at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. The center conducts research around family savings, assets, and debts. Mr. Bashira has an extensive career in banking and policy development in both the public and private sector. Over the past 25 years, he has advised presidential candidates, as well as the George W. Bush, Clinton, Obama, and Trump administrations. An author of books and articles, Bashira has written for the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Atlantic, and the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, among others, is, and is quoted, regularly by local and national media outlets. Raised in Akron, Ohio, Bashiri is a graduate of the Ohio State University, Yale Divinity School, and the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. Mr. Bashiri is a board member of many local organizations, including the Peace and Justice Commission, one of today's program co-sponsors. We're fortunate to have him here in St. Louis and with us today, Mr. Bashiri. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you all for your time. And I, I really appreciate the lovely and informative uh, introduction from Alyssa and Yolanda and Rabbi Fader. Um, it's a hard act to follow already. Uh, so, uh, yeah, thank you for the kind introduction as well. And, um, you know, I am here today on behalf of the Federal Reserve. Uh, but I also want you to know that I'm a pr proud member of the Peace and Justice Commission here in St. Louis, of which um, Marie Kenyon um, is the director. And so, um, and you know, in both my day job and and the work on the Peace and Justice Commission, we work on the racial wealth gap and racial justice. So it's a real pleasure and honor for me to be part of this interfaith discussion as well. It brings together my own faith and my own work. So I really welcome this opportunity to share a few thoughts with you and also especially to the conversation uh, that's gonna follow. So um, my job today, as I understand it, is to put a little bit of a fact base on the table about the racial wealth gap to talk about the economics um, of the racial wealth gap. So we all have kind of a common understanding of that. And, um, and, and what I'm gonna do is give you what I'm going to call four disturbing facts about the racial wealth gap. But because I don't want to leave you with that, um, I'm going to close with something um, encouraging, um, you know, some, you know, some route out of slavery, you know, some way forward, you know, some way for us to all make a difference in the lives of, of people of color and others who are, who are um, suffering from the effects of discrimination and, and racism. Um, final thing I'll say as set up, I just wanna thank my colleagues at the Fed, Bill Emmons, Lowell Ricketts, and Anna Hernandez-Kent, who have really led the research that has made this presentation possible. So, and, and so with that, I, um, I am going to share my screen with everybody here, and I hope I can figure this out. Um, I got a note here that the host has disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, oh wait, there we are. 
so I need, I need, I guess I need somebody to let me do that. Or if um, Alyssa would like to just we have my you, slides. You have screen oh. sharing now. Oh, I do. Okay, thank you. So let's see here. Um, okay, and from the beginning. And there we are. Can you all see that? Yes. Okay, great. Well, um, so let me, um, let me just um, go over to the first slide. So as I said, I have four, you know, four disturbing facts and one encouraging fact to close on. So the very first one here um, is, you know, on every single measure uh, that we could come up with at the St. Louis Fed about wealth, Blacks have lower levels of wealth than whites. Okay, you can see here that um, whether you're looking at median net worth, which is um, sort of the middle of the distribution, all your assets minus all your liabilities, um, you know, whites have uh, $184,000, typical white family compared to just 23 for blacks. Home ownership rate, 73 versus 45%. Um, how many days could you live just on your emergency savings if you have to? Um, 31 for white families, five for blacks. That's a huge difference. Um, how many families are underwater? 8% versus 18%. Um, and how many have already become a millionaire? 15% of white families are already millionaires compared to just 2% for, for blacks. So, um, you know, these are, um, these are very real numbers here. And, um, let, let me, there's a really important point though I want to make here. The gap is huge and it's disturbing, but I don't want to lose sight of the fact that the actual levels of wealth that black families have to live on, um, you know, that lower level of wealth really matters. So when you, if you have only $23,000 in net worth compared to 184, that may be the difference between economic security, if, you, if your car breaks down, or if you want to send your kids to college or pass some wealth on to a family or start a business. I mean, you know, we, we do focus on the gap, but it's very important, if not more important, to focus on how much wealth do families actually have. And one of, uh, I think, an important task for all of us, it, it is great to close the gap, but the real effort, I think, and the real opportunity is to grow the wealth at the bottom so that families can live better lives, more lives with dignity, more opportunity for themselves and for their kids, okay? Uh, the next slide here is basically looking at what's happened over the last 30 years, the last generation with the racial wealth gap. And, um, you know, the, the, what, what you can see here is that there's been a lot of variation among white wealth, mm -hmm. which is the top line, um, and the black wealth, which is the lower line, you know, there's been less variation, but also a lot less growth. Okay, mm -hmm. so black wealth actually did increase, um, you know, since 1989 and since 2016, but uh, we've had far more growth um, among white families. So even though there's been a lot of variation, we have what we call like an enduring wealth gap. You know, you know, the, 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 you know, some data show that the gap has actually gotten a lot worse. The Fed data uh, shows that there's been a lot of variation, but essentially we have a, a, a gap that won't really go away. And what's most disturbing about this, and this is my second fact here, is that other progress that African-American families have made, very meaningful progress in political representation, combating legal discrimination, post-secondary education, uh, voting rights, it's not translating into more wealth for black families. Okay, there's a problem here that somehow all these other gains are not showing up in the wealth numbers. And the scholars, um, Sandy Darity and Kirsten Mullen, along with um, the New York Times writer, uh, Hannah Nicole Jones, uh, Nicole Hannah Jones, uh, said that if you don't make budget, if you don't make progress on the racial wealth gap, if you don't actually increase the net worth of, of, of African American families, then we're not really making the kind of progress that we need to. Because without wealth, you don't have security, you don't have opportunity, and it's hard to pass on wealth to your kids. All right. So this is a really important measure here. Um, my next slide um, is really you know, as I was saying, we, we have all this progress that is not really uh, translating 
um, into more wealth for, for, for black families. And, uh, and, and the education front is probably one of the most surprising and one of the most enduring of those. So here we can see that if you look at you know, this graph, what it does is it by education level shows the wealth of white, black and Hispanic families. Now, the good news is that generally as your education level rises, so does your wealth. OK, that's the good news. The bad news is that um, as education rises, the wealth, you know, the wealth of white families goes up significantly more than it does for black and Hispanic families. OK, so white families are getting far greater returns on their investment in education than black and Hispanic families are. You know, education is not translating into more wealth. So unfortunately, rather than education being the great equalizer, it's actually um, an engine of the racial wealth gap. It's not closing it, it's making it worse. So the biggest wealth gap that we see is between black and white families with graduate degrees, okay? And again, the gap just gets bigger and bigger with education. And there's all kinds of reasons for that that we can talk about in the discussion if you'd like, but student loans is certainly part of that, okay? Because um, it displaces the other wealth that other families can accumulate uh, when they have those loans. All right, and there are huge differences between the rates and the amount of student loans between white and black families. All right, now we're going on to um, my fourth and uh, final disturbing fact. And, um, and uh, this really is building on uh, the, 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 the superb setup that um, Alyssa offered about the different types of racism. Um, and what I'm going to show here on this, this, uh, this slide here, which I apologize is a little bit confusing, it's basically showing that, um, you know, we have this huge racial wealth gap. Um, when we did this study, it was about a 10 to 1 gap. But what we show here is that the majority of that gap um, is structural and historical and embedded. OK, and and basically the big insight from from our study here was, you know, people often want to blame black people for having lower wealth because they don't spend properly. They don't save, you know, they're not, they're not making good choices in their lives. Right. And that's an unfortunate and a very damaging myth. And so what we did in our at the St. Louis Fed is we compared black and white families who actually made the same educational, financial, and family choices. And we said, well, you know, that should close the gap if we compare black and white families who made the same choices. Well, it turns out that when you compare black and white families who made the same choices, you still have an 80% 80, 80 of the wealth gap still exists, all right? You can't get rid of it. That's because it's embedded, it's historical, it's structural. Right, it's 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 part of their our 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 history, and and that's because wealth begets wealth. If you don't have wealth to begin with, and because of the public policies that Alyssa showed us a little bit earlier, all those opportunities where we legally, as a matter of public policy, told African Americans you cannot accumulate wealth, those decisions of many generations over the years show up in the wealth gap numbers that we have today and will not entirely go away and will not overwhelmingly go away simply because blacks make better, quote unquote, better financial choices. So, you know, what I want to say here is that we have this myth of the post-racial view, uh, which is that the world, the economic playing field is, is equal, um, you know, and that if you don't have a lot of wealth, that means you made poor choices. And we're saying, no, that's wrong. In fact, we have a structural view, which says when you have different wealth outcomes between blacks and whites, that reflects poor opportunities more than it reflects uh, poor choices. OK, so I think the way we have to think about really making moving the needle um, on the racial wealth gap is addressing both, you know, especially addressing some of the structural and historical elements um, of that gap. OK, so I promised to end on something more optimistic, uh, you know, coming out of slavery, uh, you know, doing our part to 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 to, uh, uh, you know, to, to make a better world. Thank you, Rabbi. 
Um, you know, the, the, I'm encouraged here for three reasons. One is that um, we have much greater awareness about the racial wealth gap than we used to. Secondly, we have far more resolve to do something about it than we've ever had. Um, and third, we actually have data showing that if we, you know, that certain interventions will work and that if we make, and if we, and if we, and if we make some of these changes, it's going to be good for everybody. So, you know, I'm, I'm really encouraged here and I hope you all are as well. So just very briefly, in the near term, clearly, you know, people of color are disproportionately hit by, by COVID. The wealth numbers that I showed you earlier are only as of 2019 and they're likely to get worse you know, as the pandemic continues to ravage, uh, ravage, especially low income, low wealth, people of color and women, right? So I think the first thing we have to do is, you know, is a rescue package as, as it's being discussed right now in DC to get families and the economy back on track. Secondly, you know, debts are a huge burden, especially for people of color. And, and you know, we, we ought to consider relief for those loans. And third, we need to help families to simply build up their rainy day savings, which a lot of research shows makes a huge difference in the stability of families and their ability to move up. Now, longer term, I think we tend to put that in three different categories. What do you do looking back? What do you do for people like living now and ongoing? And then third, what do you do for future generations? Now, looking back, um, you know, there's a discussion around reparations. Um, as a matter of fact, if you all are around exactly a week from today, I'm hosting a book talk at the Fed with uh, Sandy Darity and Kirsten uh, Mullen, who are talking about their book on reparations. We also have to look um, uh, at things like tax code reform, you know, finding better paying jobs, alternatives to a four year college degree, making home ownership wealth building and small business development. And then finally, I'm a huge fan of baby bonds, this idea of setting up savings and investment accounts at birth for all kids. As a matter of fact, um, another similar proposal is taking the 529 college savings accounts that some of you may use or your kids may have used and setting those up automatically at birth for all kids. And as a matter of fact, there's actually a proposal uh, a legislative proposal here in Missouri to do just that. I work at the Fed. I'm not allowed to lobby, but I encourage you all to take a look at that, to look at that bill and lend your support if you're able to do so. Okay, so I'm going to close with that. And if for anybody who's interested in the event uh, next week, uh, there's the information and perhaps, uh, you know, somebody could share, share this link with others afterwards if they would like to sign up. Uh, for that. And with that, I am glad to stop talking and listen and learn and, 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 and uh, participate in the conversation. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Ray, for the presentation. I, I would have to say it was more, it's more than enlightening. Uh, really appreciated seeing toward the end the near-term responses and the longer-term responses, which does it as structural racism part of the terminology that Alyssa spoke of at the onset of our meeting. Many are asking, will the slides be provided? Yes, the slides and the video will be sent to participants. Uh, if you have a question for Ray, please type it into the chat and we will have time for questions and answers after our next speakers. And uh, to move to our local portion of the program, I would like to now introduce Dick Wise. And it's a pleasure to uh, have uh, to introduce Dick. And he will also introduce the speaker, the story, local storyteller. He has served as a reporter and editor at the St. Louis Post-Dispatch for 30 years, along with his wife, Sally Altman. He is the founder and executive editor of the nonprofit Before Ferguson, Beyond Ferguson whose mission is to share the stories of people of color in the St. Louis region as they are challenged by systemic racism. Dick. I'm sorry, I think I was on mute. I'll start again. Uh, thanks, Yolanda. As you mentioned, uh, we're a group of storytellers who've written stories over the last three years advancing the cause of uh, racial equity. And they've appeared in mainstream media, including the Post-Dispatch, the St. Louis American, Rear Front Time, St. Louis Magazine, Jewish Light, and St. Louis Public Radio. More recently, in the time of this pandemic, we set our sights on neighborhoods within the 63106 zip code. Well, why 63106? 
Well, a landmark study prepared by researchers at Washington University's Brown School of Social Work revealed that across our entire region, 63106 had the most problematic social determinants of health. One revealing data point, a child born in 63106 in 2010 would have had a life expectancy of 67 years old. Contrast that to 63105, Clayton, wealthy and mostly white. There a child could expect to live to 85. And this was before the pandemic. Well, our guest today, Kim Daniel, has been the subject of several of our stories that have appeared at St. Louis Public Radio. She's been our partner in demonstrating the difficulty that families have faced over generations in gaining their purchase on the American dream. Kim is 54 and in many ways among the most vulnerable people in an exceedingly vulnerable neighborhood as she has dealt with a congenital heart defect that has brought her to death's door several times over the course of her life. But she's also irrepressible. She's currently making her living as a family outreach coordinator at the Flance Early Education Center. And she harbors a dream of someday moving out of her high crime neighborhood and owning a home. In fact, she wants to create a kind of a compound where many members of her family can live and enjoy life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, something that we should all be entitled to. We're gonna talk a little bit about her quest and the obstacles that lie in her path. Welcome, Kim. Hello. Uh, Kim, one of the things that uh, Ray, Ray mentioned that, that, that was kind of interesting to me, uh, and I know uh, relevant to you, is that there are already programs in place, uh, some of which have been a benefit to you. and. Uh, Maybe on a positive note, we should talk about that. I know that you have benefited uh, in terms of getting uh, your college, a college education uh, from some of those programs. Talk a little bit about that, if you would. Well, I was able to qualify for the vocational rehabilitation grant uh, up to $250,000, along with the federal Pell Grant and an Arkansas uh, state grant and the uh, Minority Teachers College Fund. And so those allowed me to attend a school in uh, Arkansas at uh, Mid-South uh, Community. It was Mid-South Community College at the time. It is now Mid-South, uh, Arkansas State University at Mid-South. So I got there when there were still trailers on the ground. But uh, those, uh, those, funds allowed me to go to school free of charge. And I went for five years. However, due to my health situation, I was constantly having to drop classes. And eventually I had to have open heart surgery. And the only place I could get that help was here in St. Louis uh, because most cardiologists do not specialize in adults with congenital heart defects. Uh, so um, I came, I, I returned home to St. Louis and I was short 21 credit hours for my associate's degree in elementary education. Yeah, and I'm imagining if you were able to complete that degree and maybe go on and um, get an advanced degree, uh, your income would be uh, substantially more. It would. Yeah. So uh, one of the uh, things that's interesting uh, uh, is uh, how you came to be in uh, Preservation Square. You're in a uh, uh, what we, we've come to call a subsidized uh, housing unit. How does that work? Well, they go according to your income. Uh, I applied for housing when I was still living in Arkansas. Uh, Three years later, I received a letter just at the same time I was in need of this surgery. And they, uh, what is the housing authority, sent me a letter stating that I qualified I, and they assigned me O'Fallon Place Apartments. I was asking for Murphy Park Apartments. Anywho, uh, I end up in Preservation Square. They have a program uh, called uh, Project-based Section 8 or Title 1A or A1, I'm not, don't quote me. Uh, and um, 
I end up in that program because my only source of income was SSI or is SSI. Yeah, so you, you really had uh, limited choices in terms of uh, uh, where you could live and uh, the kind of amenities uh, that you wanted. And, uh, and uh, the other thing that's a kind of a complicating factor, um, not only for you, but for many African Americans are uh, dealing with these, uh, these illnesses, they, they kind of knock you down. And then you have to navigate a health care system that is uh, pretty complicated to talk a little bit about that. Yes. Uh, well, it was worse in Arkansas than it is in Missouri. In Arkansas, you had no choice. Uh, who your uh, primary care physician was or who the cardiologist would be. And in Missouri, um, you are allowed to choose, uh, but that would, but my cardiologist was chosen for me based on my congenital heart defect. Uh, I can say there were only so few people that dealt with it and I end up with a great specialist who has now passed away. Uh, but in in getting a what do you internal medicine doctor, that's a difficulty because you can't. A lot of doctors will not accept Missouri Medicaid, and you're stuck with the clinics that are available. And the clinics, well, you're stuck with the clinics that are available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I imagine you run into um, sometimes. Uh, uh, doctors or people in care that are indifferent to your needs? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So that, that's one issue. Now, the other issue that you deal with, and it has an economic uh, uh, element to it, is crime. Uh, you had an incident uh, next door. Uh, tell, tell us a little bit, bit about that one night. Uh, you're working, you're uh, making a little extra income making masks, uh, COVID masks. And all of a sudden, gunfire breaks out next door. What happened? Yes, uh, it it was seen that my neighbor uh, decided to have a gunfight with an, uh, the community further east of here, which we now know we know is Cochrane, but they changed it from Cochrane to Cambridge Heights. Anyway, uh, long story short, they decided to have this gunfight. I was sitting there at the sewing machine, and a bullet came through the wall of my apartment, not from the street, but from the other apartment directly behind me. And later on that week, he apologized to me. He said, oh, I'm sorry, Miss Kim, but it was, it was those guys' fault. You know, they were on us. And I won't go into the whole details, but they were on him and he had to go and get some more weapons, he said, ammunition. And yeah. in the process of gathering more weapons, the people saw where he was and the shootout pursued. Right, and so you uh, uh, wrote to your, uh, I guess a kind of a landlord or a yeah, figure Lisa and she said, I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna be able to get out of here. And you have developed over many years a plan, and we have just a minute left uh, to deal with this, but we'll have time later, a plan to um, uh, pool your family's resources to the extent that you have them uh, to find a, a place out state to live, to create almost a compound, as it were. Tell us about that. Well, that's the idea. My, my goal is if we could all put our resources together and buy a, a plot of land, preferably five to 10, maybe 20 acres of land. And we all work that land together, creating a, uh, a farm of some type, anything that would give us um, econ an economic advantage. But if we would have to do it all together, and hopefully we could do it going through the US Department of uh, Agriculture, USDA, because they have land grants and farm grants and other even single family home grants. Yeah, so that's, uh, uh, you got to do some handsprings. And uh, I know you told me alone, uh, you do not have the uh, kind of a credit uh, uh, 
standing uh, through a bank to uh, to get you know sort of a conventional loan like um, many people of privilege do. Well, no, I have the credit. I have mm -hmm. excellent credit. I have insufficient income. Right. I, I made sure my credit stayed in good standing throughout my life because I've always wanted my own land. The problem is I can't get it on my own if SSI is my sole source of income. Okay, well, Kim, thanks so much. There'll be time later for folks to uh, ask you some questions, but I'm gonna turn it back over uh, to you, Lana. Thank you. Wow, thanks, uh, Dick and Kim. Kim, we really appreciate you being here, sharing. There are over 200 people on the call and being able to share where you are, uh, that, that it takes a lot. And we really do appreciate the things that you're doing to work towards uh, systemic racism. Uh, and of course it does beg the question, what can we do to address the systemic racism that impacts economic equity in our region? And to that end, I'd like to introduce Amy Hammerman from the National Council of Jewish Women to offer two action items. Amy. Hi, uh, thanks for the intro. Um, I'm Amy Hammerman, the State Policy Advocacy Chair with National Council of Jewish Women. Um, Ray mentioned several articles during his talk and as a follow-up to the program, we will be making sure that we have links to these articles for you so that um, we can continue to learn about today's topic. In terms of legislative advocacy, um, there are a couple of actions that you can take. Um, first is the um, child savings um, account uh, bill that Ray talked about. It is House Bill HB 627, referred to as the Show Me Child Development Account Program. This bill would establish a savings account for every child in our state. Uh, the bill is likely to have a hearing on it next week. So in follow-up to our session today, um, you'll be receiving a list of, list of the legislators who are on the House Emerging Issues Committee, which is um, the one that um, we expect is gonna hear this bill. Um, we urge you to contact them and let you know that you support this bill. We will also include a link to help you find um, your legislator as well, if you want to do that. Um, another bill that um, we urge you to consider lending your support to is HCR 14. This is a House joint resolution that would urge specific actions to address the economic and public health crisis caused by systemic racism and has been greatly magnified by the COVID-19 pandemic in Missouri. Systemic racism and structures of racial discrimination create generational poverty, perpetuate debilita debilitating economic, educational, and health hardships, and uh, they disproportionately affect people of color causing the single most profound economic and social challenge facing Missouri. We will include um, links to contact your representatives and um, links to more information as well as the text of the bill following the session. Um, please contact your legislators, ask them to support this bill as, a, as well as HB 627 and um, contact the key members of the House leadership um, that we will send you and ask them to sign, uh, assign this bill to a committee. Um, finally, um, we encourage you to support black owned businesses in our region. There are two great websites that we encourage you to check out. They are the uh, St. Louis Black Pages and also um, for the culture um, STL. Um, you can find pretty much the, the range of services, goods and services that you're looking for, some awesome restaurants and shops um, that could really use um, and appreciate your patronage, especially during these economic times. Thanks. Thank you, Amy. We'd now like to open it up for questions from our participants. If you have any questions for Ray Bashir or for Dick Wise or Kim Daniel, please type it in the chat. We have seen several questions in the chat and I'm going to turn it over to Cheryl who will ask the questions of each of our guest um, panelists. Hi, thank you, Yolanda. So this question is for Ray and it's kind of a combination of a lot of the questions that we're seeing. Why does the wealth cap 
persist even at higher education levels uh, with some follow-ons or educated blacks not getting jobs or getting them but at lower pay and can racial equity issues within employers make a difference here yes thank you for the for the question there's a lot of reasons to explain the differences between uh, the wealth of black and white college graduates um, one of them it is that um, Corey Corey Codell wrote a paper showing that African Americans don't have the same academic preparation uh, coming into college and they're less likely to major in STEM, uh, you know, which leads to fewer paying jobs and less wealth. So that's one of the reasons. The second is student loans. Uh, blacks have, are more likely to take out the loans and have higher levels of loans, which displaces their ability to accumulate um, other kinds of wealth. And then finally, we simply have too many uh, families going to college, uh, people of color and, and other low income families of, who um, might get a degree that they don't really need uh, and uh, ended up not getting paid properly. So there is a, a little bit of a, uh, there are too many college graduates uh, kind of in the market, which is depressing the returns for a, especially a lot of low income people. Thank you, Ray. You would also, there's been several questions just for clarifications on your slide. Were the slides you pre were presenting uh, national or were they for the St. Louis region? They're national. We Unfortunately, wealth data is really hard to get locally. Um, so the, all the data were national. Um, there is a question. Um, about how the for-profit colleges impact people of lower income. Terribly, <laughs> period, terribly. They need to be better regulated. Um, and they're really just, they're just degree factories with no real returns and no accountability. Uh, a question that's come up about um, how can we invest in black owned businesses and what other investment vehicles are available? We've learned from other presentations that capital, access to capital is a real issue especially because the generational wealth isn't there. That's correct. Um, banks need to do a better job of lending, but there's something called CDFIs, Community Development Financial Institutions, which serve as intermediaries and in black and other low wealth communities. And they receive grants from governments and others to make those loans. You may have heard that Netflix just made a huge uh, you know, uh, donation to a group called Hope Enterprise based in the South. And through them, they're going to be making a lot of loans to help more small businesses. And thankfully, the new administration plans to expand those, the CDFIs. A question for Kim. Um, what is the status on your, um, your loan and, and your plan? Are you, uh, uh, are you seeing uh, a way to get to where you want to be? Presently, I'm not seeing a way to where I would like to be. Uh, I have no loans at this moment other than my vehicle, uh, uh, but uh, because of the rehabilitation grant, the Pell Grant, the Arkansas State Grant, and the Minority Teacher Scholarship Fund, I had no college debt at all. So a, a question for Ray to uh, address Kim. Is there, are you aware of programs that can support someone in, uh, that Kim cannot be the only one in this situation who has excellent credit, but, uh, but no other income in addition to her SSI. She's not looking for a very big loan. Are there other markets other than banks that uh, potentially we can direct people to? There aren't enough. Um, I would point to credit unions who's trying to fill that space really well. The St. Louis Community Credit Union here in St. Louis is not only providing a, a great example uh, here in St. Louis, but they've become a model nationally for how credit unions can fill that space. Great. Are there, oh, go ahead, Kim. No, I was going to say, I've been a member of the credit union since I was 14 years old. I prefer credit unions over banks, however, Due to the SSI uh, income, it's, it's an impossibility. Um, now, I did start working with AmeriCorps this 
uh, but March will finish my course with AmeriCorps due to health reasons. Uh, but that I was my thought was to use that co income to try to purchase land. That's not going to work now that I can no longer continue the program. Uh, but because I manage money so well, the problem would be that organizations say, well, you need to have at least three months of, of a safety net. And there's an impossibility to have three months of a safety net when you have SSI. And, and this, what Kim is explaining so beautifully is what structural and institutional racism is. That it, it's a circle that uh, someone who cannot get out of without some, uh, some differences to the structure and some, uh, as Alyssa talked about earlier, access to equity. Uh, so part of, the, part of the challenges that we continue to face. Um, I don't see a, additional Q&A um, that I don't think has been covered already. So I'm gonna re uh, re uh, go back to Yolanda here. Okay, so wow. So thank you all to all of our speakers, Ray Bashira, Dick Wise, and Kim Daniel for sharing your time, talent, and passion with us today and the slides and all the information that's been provided to us. As has been mentioned earlier, we will be sending a follow-up email to all of our attendees with links to the action items and additional resources that were shared today. It is now one o'clock. And we know that some of you may have to leave. And for those of you who are able, we invite you to spend some time in a small group to give some time to process all that we've heard in the last, in the last hour. While you're in your groups, please consider the following two questions. What is the main thing you take away from today's presentation? What is the one thing you will do tomorrow to address what you heard here today? And with that, Alyssa is going to put us into our small groups. And again, thank you to each of you who stayed with us and who participated and attended today. Thank you. All right, well, thank you all for being with us today. And we really hope that you found the, the process useful and that learning from each other was helpful. I saw a lot of it in the chat. And in wrapping up, I do want to say one of the biggest things that we took away, I took away with someone who was on the in my group is how do we as organizations really work to leverage the resources and think about what Rabbi Fader talked about in the scarcity model. We do not have to operate from that space, but how do we really organizationally come together and figure out what it looks like to really ensure that we are helping those persons who are most vulnerable. Yes. With that, I want to say thank you all and thank you Cheryl and Alyssa for all of your help today and answering my questions via text and earlier. Uh, our next program is March 10th at 12 p.m. and we will be addressing the systemic racism around access to health care for people of color in both St. Louis and beyond. We hope you will join us then. Thanks again to all of our speakers and co-sponsors. Be safe and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>